So thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, today's uh, presenter will be Ying Jin from Stanford University, and she is going to speak on selection by prediction. If you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or to interrupt and ask uh, at any time for clarification. And thank you, Ying, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. Um, so uh, I am Ying, uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Stanford Statistics. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's my great pleasure today to talk about my recent work on selection by prediction. It is about prediction assistant screening and discovery with conformal p-values. So this is joint work with my advisor, Emmanuel Candice. So nowadays, machine learning prediction is assisting a lot of human decisions. So here, uh, these three article titles show how machine learning prediction is helping with recruitment. So in job hiring, it helps us to ask, uh, answer the question who to reach out to and who to proceed to interview. The promise is that by building machine learning prediction models, it can automatically help you find suitable candidates and quickly assess the candidates, even without your input. On the other hand, machine learning prediction is also assisting scientific discoveries. So here I show you two articles uh, saying about how machine learning is accelerating and automating drug discovery. So similarly, in drug discovery, it is helping us to find out which molecules or compounds to proceed to physical screening and clinical trials later on. So in this talk, we will focus on decision and discovery processes, where the goal can be summarized as finding a few interesting cases from a huge pool. So the previous two applications I talked about kind of fall in this category. So for example, in drug discovery, we may have a disease and a whole pool of candidate drugs. So the pool can be very large in the size, maybe hundreds of thousands of drugs, and we know their chemical and physical features, but we really want to know is their activity towards the disease. And the goal of drug discovery is to, to find a few highly active drugs from this pool. And in job hiring, we may have a specific position and have a bunch of job applicants or potential candidates. So what we really want to do is to find highly competent applicants to this specific position and let them proceed to later stages of talent sourcing. So what is the traditional approach to do this? Um, during this talk, I will always keep the drug discovery example um, uh, to show the to show the process. So let's say we have a disease and a whole bunch of candidate drugs. There is a technique in called physical screening (HTS), which is short for high throughput screening. So it is a physical approach in the sense that um, you will need to put the molecules or compounds into a machine. The machine will return you some evaluated activity scores for each screened drug. So here I denote as Y1, Y2, Y3. Um, these are the evaluated activity scores that are true to these drugs. And then after having these activity scores, people will prioritize high score drugs. Like how high the score should be to be pri prioritized will depend on domain knowledge. So for example, if you uh, if the Y is binary, then people will think of like Y equals one to be active. And if Y is continuously valid, maybe there is some prior knowledge, for example, Y larger than 2.5 is active. And after this prioritized step, we will get a smaller set, um, maybe only in the size of 1000 or, or 100. And that's not the end of, uh, the, end of the story. Um, following the smaller set, the smaller set will be uh, evaluated in more uh, expensive clinical trials. And maybe after 10 years and billions of invest uh, investment, it finally get approved by FDA and start to help people. 
So there are two places that this approach can incur a lot of cost. The first is the physical screening step. So people have been realizing that because nowadays we have very huge drug libraries, conducting physical screening for all the candidate drugs to evaluate their activity score is super expensive and slow. And the second place it can incur a lot of cost is the follow-up studies, because the selected set should be carefully investigated before any final decision is made. So in response to the first part of cost, here is how machine learning comes into help. So people have been using a approach called virtual screening, which is in contrast to physical screening. Basically, it is using machine learning prediction to replace the exhaustive physical screening. So there is a huge literature on that. I'm here only listing three of them. So let's say we have a bunch of already evaluated drugs. So you have their features such as structure information and their true evaluated on activity score Y. Then you can build a machine learning model that predicts the Y based on X, and then generate the predicted activity scores for the drugs that you don't know. So here we denote that as Y1 hat, Y2 hat, because this is the predicted value, but not the actual activity score. But a good point about this is that these predict activity scores are extremely low cost and fast to generate once your prediction model is built. And what happens next is similar to before, people will prioritize high predicted score of drugs, get a smaller set and proceed to expensive clinical trials. So as I said before, there is another part that can incur a lot of cost, which is the follow-up studies. And only the smaller selected set will incur this kind of cost. So this means that the error on the selected smaller set is much more concerning because of the costly follow-up studies. So this leads to the natural question, what guarantee is sensible if we really want to find a smaller set from a huge pool? And next, because we are using complex machine learning prediction models such as deep learning, the question is whether prediction from these complex machines can be trusted. So just to provide quick answer to uh, these two questions in this work, we will study screening method that uh, ensures error control on the selected candidates. So basically we're just trying to wrap, uh, wrap around any prediction model to get a smaller set and have some guarantee on the selected set. So how we do this can be summarized as follows. Let's say we are given a bunch of candidate drugs and a black box prediction model. Our method is a wrapper for this machine learning model. And instead of outputting the predicted scores, Y1 hat, Y2 hat, we will uh, output calibrated confidence scores, P1, P2, so on and so forth. So these calibrated confidence scores are somehow uh, standardized. So they all take values from zero to one. And then we will use a standardized method to threshold the confidence scores, P1, P2, P3, so on and so forth. And this gives us the smaller set. And the remaining step is just the same as before. And our promise is that if you want 90%, then I can guarantee that 90% of this set are active drugs on average. And we believe this makes uh, the machine learning model trustful um, for the screening task. Okay. So just to lay out the discussion, um, here is some mathematical setup. So we will assume access to any pre-trained machine learning model mu hat. It is a mapping from the feature space curly X to the label space curly Y. So the label space can be binary or continuously valid. And here by pre-trained, maybe it is slightly different from uh, the way people usually call it. By pre-trained here, I mean that this machine learning model is trained on an independent uh, holdout data, such that mu hat is independent of our training and test samples. And we have a bunch of training data, xi and yi, i from one to n. These, uh, you, you can imagine them to be the 
already screen drugs so that we have both their structural information and their true activity score. And we have test samples X M plus J and Y M plus J, J from one to M. You, 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 you can imagine that uh, these are like the new drugs we have. So we only get to observe their covariates, but not their outcomes. And for now, we will assume the training and test samples are IID from an unknown distribution. You can imagine them to be drugs drawn from a diverse drug library. And this assumption will be relaxed later on to allow for distribution shift. And uh, the task we are interested in is to find large outcomes. So we'll say we have some user specified thresholds CM plus J. And what we are interested in is to finding out test samples such that the unknown outcome YM plus J is larger than CM plus J. So here, what we observe is the CM plus J and we never get to observe the Y, but we still want to find large outcomes. Can and I so, uh, can yes. ask for clarification? So the threshold can depend on the drug. So the C, uh, the C can depend on J? Yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, huh, okay. So it can even be like random variables associated with the test sample. Okay, thank you. Great. Mm, yeah, so the guarantees we are seeking for is to find a subset curly R of the test sample. And these are seen as promising candidates. So intuitively the, the curly R is the smaller set we have uh, we find out in the previous illustration. And we want to control the false discovery rate, FDR, below some pre-specified value Q. This Q is larger than zero, but smaller than one. So the FDR was proposed by Benjamin and Hochberg decades ago and was very famous in the literature of statistical hypothesis testing. So by definition, it is the expectation of FDP. FDP is the false discovery proportion. So as the name suggests, FDP is the ratio. Um, on the numerator, it is the number of selected but uninteresting units. And on the denominator, it is uh, approximately the number of selected units, but we take the maximum between one and the cardinality of curly R, just to ensure that this ratio is well-defined. So, Approximately speaking, the FDR measures like what proportion in your selected set are interesting, uh, on, are not interesting drugs. So you can imagine the smaller set will have more expensive follow-up studies. So bounding the FDR ensures that there is a small only a small proportion of follow-up resources wasted on, on interesting cases. And this is a measure for uh, resource efficiency for later stages. Okay. So because we are really in the prediction regime, like we never know the why, so we need some reliable prediction um, method. And conformal inference is such a technique if you have heard it before. So it was proposed by Wolfgang et al. Uh, in 2005. Um, the simplest form just takes three steps if you want to construct a pr prediction interval. So it proceeds as follows. If you have a machine learning model that is separately trained, you can just build any score function V of X or Y based on the machine learning model. So here I uh, put an example, which is V of X, X and Y is minus the absolute value of Y minus mu hat of X. So you can think, Think of it as the residual, uh, the absolute re residual of this prediction. And you can compute, uh, and the second step is to compute the training scores, which is just plugging in the xi and the yi of the, uh, of the training sample into this score function. And the final step, just to con construct the prediction interval, given any uh, feature value xn plus j, is just to take the set of y such that if you plug in x and plus j and y into the score function, the score you obtain is larger than the alpha quantile of the empirical distribution of the vi's. 
So that's it for constructing a conformal prediction interval. And it enjoys an assumption-free guarantee saying that as long as the training and test samples are IID without any modeling assumptions, the probability, uh, the prediction interval at level alpha we just constructed is guaranteed to cover the unknown outcome with probability at least one minus alpha. And the probability is marginalized over uh, the training and the J's test sample. So the probability is separate for each J. And this result is true for any score function that builds on any independently trained machine learning model. So because of the simplicity of this method and the nice guarantee of this um, prediction interval, there is actually a literature on using conformal prediction intervals for drug discovery. And similar to ours, the motivation is always to control the error in the whole process and making machine learning prediction reliable. So here I just list some of them, but there are more of this type of work. But the first thing we want to argue here is that validity for one single point is not sufficient because just to be sure, um, the coverage guarantee is over the randomness in the training data and the J's test, test data. So let's say in binary classification to find Y equals one with smaller than Q error, should we just choose the, predict, uh, choose the test samples whose prediction set look like a singleton of one? Because in binary classification, the prediction interval will be either a singleton of zero, either a singleton of one, or the set of zero and one. And I, I, I will say this simple idea would be valid if those prediction intervals that is of the value a singleton of one can cover the y plus j with probability one minus q. But this is not exactly what we have from the guarantee of conformal inference because conformal inference is over all the test, uh, all the randomness of the test uh, sample. But here, what we really need is the coverage on the selected. So here I have a figure that uh, uh, illustrates this point. So let's say we have 10 test samples. Here are uh, 10 dots. So we have seen their X and we construct the prediction interval for, for the 10 samples. And we set the Q to be 0.2. So the guarantee says that on average, only two of them are um, not valid. Like, only two of them would miss the true outcome. So here, the dots are the outcomes. So eight of them are covered by the prediction interval, but only two of them uh, are, are missing. Then we look at the prediction interval and trying to identify the most promising intervals. Maybe we'll find that the two red intervals are very promising because they are short and their values are high. But it is quite probable that this, the two errors we have exactly occur on these two selected sets. So in, in, in this case, although we have 20% of miscoverage on average, we, we, we will have 100 of error on the selected. But unfortunately, constructing prediction intervals and then selecting promising ones is the approach that is taken in, the, in most of the works regarding conformal inference for recovery. So here I illustrate this point with a real data. So this is the real data of drug discovery. We have the X and the Y is binary. So we want to find a positive Y. And what, what we do is to build one minus alpha prediction sets which take the form singleton or both labels. And we set the alpha to vary from zero to one. And we select, uh, and for each fixed alpha, we will select test samples whose um, prediction set is exactly a singleton of one. And this gives the orange curve, which is the uh, coverage error on these selected um, prediction intervals. And the, the x-axis on, on this plot is the marginal confidence level one minus alpha. So we can see that even if we set the one minus alpha to be extremely close to one, meaning that we only make maybe 1% of the error on average, the error is still exceedingly high on this selected um, test samples. It can be as high as maybe um, 40%. 
but the marginal miscoverage is always ex exactly valid for this method. So the so this kind of selection issue is really concerning, and we should not naively take this approach. So here comes our approach. So our proposal is to threshold confidence measures instead of looking at prediction intervals. So our main idea is to use a sequence of prediction intervals to decide a confidence measure. And then we will use multiple testing ideas to threshold a confidence measure. So the approach is not that complicated. The first few uh, steps are still the same, but we require a little bit more. So here we need to have any monotone score function V of X and Y that is increasing in the second argument. So here are two simple examples. You can use one-sided residual Y minus mu hat of X or fitted cumulative distribution function. And then we compute the VI on the training data, which is the same as before. And we compute test scores by plugging in X n plus J and C n plus J and obtain v hat n plus j. So here I use v hat to distinguish between the v because the v is computed using the actual y, but we don't have access to them for the test sample. And the next crucial step to, is to compute the confidence score, uh, co confidence measures. So this confidence measure pj is actually very similar to p-values in statistics, but here I will mostly call them confidence measures. So PJ is defined as the number of VI that is smaller than VN, uh, VN plus J hat plus a uniform distributed variable to break ties and divided by N plus one. So approximately speaking, PJ is um, the rank of VN plus J hat among training scores divided by the training sample size. So basically in this step, uh, this step we get a PJ for each test sample and we have P1 to Pm. After we have this M uh, confidence measures, we can get the selection set R by benjamin hochberg procedure at level Q. So here I will not talk too much about benjamin hochberg procedure. Um, it is kind of an off the shelf method. It's like, as long as you have M values that is in zero to one, it can re return you a selection set. I will go back to it, to it later. Okay, so that is basically our approach. We construct confidence measures and get a selection set. So what it implies to uh, the drug discovery pipeline is as follows. So we have a disease, we have a bunch of candidate drugs for which we don't know their outcome. We have a machine learning model that give us predicted activity scores, Y1 hat, Y2 hat, so on and so forth. You can imagine Y1 hat is the new hat of X1. Etc. So our method will use a bunch of training data to turn the predicted activity scores into a calibrated confidence score. There are P1, P2, P3, so on and so forth that uh, lies between zero and one. And we have a confidence score for, any, uh, for each drug candidate. And then we will use the standardized benjamin hochberg BH procedure at level Q to get a smaller set. Uh, such that 90% of them are active drugs. And then the remaining steps are just the same. So here we are taking care of the screening step, but not the follow-up uh, studies because we really don't think we are in the position to think of like how the drugs should eventually be decided. Um, so before we go into more mathematical stuff, let me first give you an interpretation for the confidence measure we have. So this is the definition of PJ we just introduced. And it turns out that PJ is approximately the critical point alpha, such that the prediction interval at level alpha is all larger than CM plus J. So here I just give you the previous definition of, uh, of the conformal prediction interval at level alpha. So in this case, a smaller PJ means that CM plus J is smaller than the typical behavior of the unknown outcome. So maybe it's easier to see a visual um, illustration. So by monotonicity, we know that the form of the prediction 
interval is always like one-sided. It starts with some value and extend to positive infinite. So if we start with a very small alpha, which means that we are not tolerating too much error, you can imagine that the prediction interval is very wide. So you will start also here, it, it is our interested value, cm plus j. So let's start with a very small alpha. So you only tolerate a little bit of error. You can imagine the prediction interval start with a small value. And alpha is on the uh, y-axis. And as you increase the alpha, because we tolerate more error, the prediction interval can be smaller and smaller. It can be smaller and smaller. And if there is a point that this prediction interval just crosses cm plus j, and you trace the alpha, it is our uh, confidence measure, okay? Great, so let's talk a bit more about statistics. So I am a statistics person, um, but I will only talk about this very briefly. So recall that we are interested in large outcomes. We have some cm plus j, and we are really interested in like ym plus j larger than cm plus j. Actually, this problem can be viewed as testing the random null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says that ym plus j is smaller than cm plus j. And if we reject this null hypothesis, it means that we think y is larger than cm plus j. And our confidence measure is very close to the p-value in statistics. So it is a valid p-value if we account for the randomness of uh, the hypothesis itself. So it means that for any fixed t, which is larger than zero and smaller than t, we have um, this valid type one error control. Great. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the FDR control. So this is the Benjamin Hirschberg procedure if you are really interested in what it is. So basically it ju just take uh, selects all the smallest pj, and how small it is depends on this k hat, which is uh, decided by this formula. So the theorem in our paper says that if the v function is monotone in the second argument and the training and test data are id, and we additionally require an independent assumption for cm plus j, saying that the training data, xi and yi from i i from one to n, and the j's test sample, xn plus j and yn plus j, and all the other test samples with the threshold should be mutually independent. So in this way, actually, we require c not to be adversarially uh, chosen such that the all the data structure is broken. So as long as these conditions are met for any fixed q, our output at, at level Q controls the FDR below Q. So this result is true even for random CM plus J. So it can be a random variable associated with test sample. And you can also consider another example, which is to find patients whose health risk tomorrow would be higher than their health risk today. So in that case, you can take the CM plus J to be their health risk today, which is the random variable, and Y is the tomorrow health risk. That's our main, main result. Um, I think we, I have uh, some time to talk a bit more about math, like why it works. Actually, this is not a very conventional statistical problem because now we have random hypothesis and the random hypothesis is entangled with the random p-values. And in this case, our p-values, the pj's are mutually dependent and in statistics, it is a typically challenging scenario for the FDR control. And in a nutshell, why it, uh, why, why it controls the FDR is because the PJs are somewhat positively dependent. So this ensures the FDR control. So our proof will consist of two steps. The first step is a leave one out, which uh, leads to this inequality. And I will go into details about the, the definition of these quantities uh, later on. And the second step is using a uniform distribution property and the positive dependence, which says that each expectation in the summation is bounded by Q over M. So if you sum up them, 
from j for, uh, j from one to m, you get FDR smaller than Q. So the leave one out idea is as follows. We will leverage a uncomputable Oracle p value. So we view a uh, cut pj star. It is quite similar to our pj, but the only difference is that we replace vm plus j hat by vm plus j. So the vm plus j is the true test score if we plug in ym plus j. So again, it is not computable. It is a quantity just for analysis. And we will let curly rj to star be the rejection set of bh that is applied to pj star and all the other p-values. So the only difference between our, uh, our output curly r and this curly rj to star is that we replace pj by pj star. And because of the monotonicity of the uh, score function, one can actually show that curly r is equal to curly r j to star on the event that y is a false selection. So it is selected, but not that interesting. So you can use this leave one out idea to bound the FDR. In this equation, the first equality is just the definition of FDR. And the second inequality, you this uh, the third line here to replace the curly R by the curly R J two star. And the, the last inequality is just um, taking out an event. So it is a deterministic inequality. So by leave one out, we get this. The FDR is controlled by the summation of these expectations. And in the second step, we will use uniform distribution and palliative dependence. And we can show that if the data are IID, then the Oracle p-value pj star is uniformly distributed in zero and one. And uh, there is a nice property called PRDS. I give the, the, the rigorous definition here, but what it really means is that if you observe a PJ star, uh, if you observe a lar larger PJ star, it means that in general, PL, L not equal to J are also larger. And then once we have the PRDS and then the uniform distribution, we can directly use the result from Benjamini and Yakutelli in 2001, saying that for every j, this expectation is smaller than q over n. So it's just applying the result and I'm not uh, showing you the proof details. So we have this bound in the summation of expectations and each item is smaller than q over n. So we got this FDR control. So an important takeaway here is that it works because of two important um, properties. The first one is that our PJ controls the false selection error for each single test sample. And because we care about a, an aggregated error, they work together very well to control the FDR because they are PRDS. Okay, so that's basically uh, the proof. And um, here we have talked about our approach and the mathematics proof for our FDR control. Here is some practical issues. So while the FDR is controlled for any monotone score, as said in our theorem, some choice of the scores makes it powerful. So for example, if the thresholds are constant, we find that a particularly powerful choice is the clipped score, which means that you set V of X, Y to be plus infinity or replace it by a very large constant if y is larger than c and take it to be c if y is smaller than c and minus mu hat of x. And actually this choice is a little bit more general than, than a constant case. It also applies if cm plus j is a random variable associated with, with the uh, test sample. And in binary case and c equals zero, meaning that we want to find y equals one, we show in the paper that the most ideal score should be monotone in the probability of y equals one given x equals to x. So basically speaking, we still want a, mo a more accurate pr predictor for y uh, in order to have a powerful screening procedure. Right. So after introducing the method and the theory, let's see how it works on real data. So 
we apply it to a drug property prediction task for the HIV disease. So the outcome is binary. So Y is either zero or one. And Y equals one indicates that the drug interacts with the disease. And that would be an indicator of an effective drug. So the drug library is kind of large. Uh, it is uh, 41,000 in total. And we split it as six to two to two. This means that we use 60% 60, uh, 60 of the data to train the machine learning model. And we use 20% of them as the training sample, 20% of them as the test sample. And active drugs are very sparse in this data and only 3% of the drugs are active. So you can imagine if you exhaust the uh, screen these drugs, you can only get 3% of them to be the active drug. And our hope is that by using a uh, powerful machine learning and our screening method, we can find a smaller subset to proceed to later stages, such that one minus Q of the subset are active drugs. So here we set the FDR level to be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.5. We use the small neural network to train the prediction model, but of course this can be more complicated. And I believe the performance, like the power of this method can be greatly boosted if you use a uh, complicated deep learning model. So here is the result. Uh, we show results at different FDR levels, the realized FDR, the proportion of discovered um, positives, and the size of the selection set. And we try two scores. The first one is the powerful score, the clipped one I have just mentioned. And the second score is just the, the residual y minus mu hat of x. So we see the FDR is exactly controlled, meaning that it works well. And um, the power is kind of reasonable. And the selection set size is also reasonable. So if we set Q to be 0.5, we can find um, 200 drugs out of like 8,000 test scores, such that at least half of them are correct. So th these are really a handful number of um, drugs. That's the binary case. So we also apply it to a drug target interaction prediction uh, problem. Uh, the, the data set is called Davis, and Y in this case is a continuously valued score for the binding affinity. And X is the feature for a drug target pair. So you can imagine you have features for a drug and feature for a target, and you put them together to um, get the X feature. And the drug library is about 30,000 in size in total, and we use a two to six split. So we have many unknown uh, drug targets in uh, pairs. So in this case, we set the CM plus J to be a little bit uh, complicated. It can be viewed as like changing with the drug. It is a random variable associated with the drug. So if we find, so by this definition, it means that if we find Y M plus J to be CM plus J, it means that this test, um, uh, test drug is more effective than uh, QPOP of the training drugs for this specific target index. It's a little bit complicated. So the FDR level, we set it to be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.5. Here I show the box plot of the FDP, and we still use two scores. The first one, the, the blue one is the, the residual score, and the, the red one is the, the powerful score I have mentioned. So here we see that um, the FDR is always controlled, and if the Q is set to be larger, so the first plot is Q equals to 0.1. The second plot is Q equal to 0.2. And the last plot is Q equal to 0.5. And they all control the FDR, but we see the red one uses up the budgets for the FDR. And here is the power. We also see that uh, the clipped score is more powerful in, in this setting. So in practice, we would recommend to use this powerful score if it is possible. Great. So far, we have talked about a method that turns any prediction model into a reliable selection procedure. And theoretically speaking, we have FDR control because of the monotonicity of the score function and the positive dependence of uh, the confidence scores. And it works reasonably well in real drug discovery tasks. We also consider some job hiring tasks in the paper, 
and we are working on more benchmarks and applications. So in the few next minutes, I will consider uh, I will introduce like some extensions. So next we will consider like dealing with distribution shifts. Just to be sure, um, the only assumption for our previous method to work is that we have ID training and uh, test samples. So this means that my training data, which are the drugs that I have evaluated, should be comparable to my unknown drugs. Is that true? I would say yes, if the evaluated drugs are drawn without preference from the drug library, so that they are kind of similar. But no, if you prefer drugs with some specific structures. So here I show two plots. Um, if you prefer like the blue structures in the training drugs, then essentially your new drugs will contain like more like orange drugs. So this creates the discrepancy between the two sets. And similar issues actually happen in many other tasks that our framework can be applied to. In job hiring candidates, documented last year may differ from the current. And in health monitoring, patients may differ across hospitals in demographics, so on and so forth. So we will extend the setting to a distribution shift, uh, a specific setting called covariate shift. So formally, we will assume that the test data are IID from some unknown distribution Q, and the training data are IID from some unknown distribution P. And what we only know is that they are related by a covariate shift, so that uh, the uh, likelihood ratio of these two distributions as a function of X and Y only depends on X as a function W of X. So here, for simplicity, we just assume Y is known, but in many cases, it can be accurately estimated. So this is the setting, while the distribution shift is fully attributed to covariates. An immediate consequence is that we will need a new confidence measure. So previously, we have relied on a confidence measure or p-value that is uniformly distributed if we have the actual Y. However, if there is a covariate shift and we still use the previous confidence measures, I plot the histogram in the dark green here, the naive approach, we see that it is far from uniform. And if we use them to apply our procedure, we see a very high FDR level in the, in the dark green curve. And in contrast, if you adjust for that covariate shift, we get the red histogram from our new method to get the uniform distribution again and get FDR control again. So the method is still largely similar, except that we will need a new confidence measure. So we call it weighted confidence measure or weighted conformal p-value. So it's still something like the rank of the VM plus J hat among the test score, uh, the, the training score. But the difference is that we add we add a weight to this indicator function. So approximately th this new PJ informs the weighted rank of the test score among the training scores. It turns out to preserve many nice statist uh, statistical properties as in our previous case. So we can still think of the random, hypo uh, random null hypothesis that the null hypothesis is M plus sh YM plus J is smaller than CM plus J. And in this case, our PJ is still a valid p-value for testing HJ under covariate shift. So the probability here is over both training data and the test sample J. It says that if we assert that Y is larger than C, if we see a p-value smaller than alpha, it still controls the type one error for a single test point. So that's very similar to what we had before. And you may wonder, does the previous recipe still work? Because we now have a set of confidence measures. Can I just apply BH and get a smaller set? We can recall that for the IID case, um, the two reasons that we can have the FDR control is that first, PJ controls the false selection error for each test sample, and they are PRDS. So they work well together to get the average FDR control. So we have the first property again because of the thing that, ju that I just talked about. But the question is, are they PRDS? 
unfortunately, maybe not. So in, in our draft in, in preparation, we show a counterexample that the way they conform more p-values may not be PRDS. So this means that the second property we relied on is not true. And back to the question, does the previous recipe work? We are still not sure theoretically um, because PRDS is just a sufficient condition, but not a necessary condition for FDR control. But actually, directly applying the BH works in most of our numerical experiments. And just to be safe, in our forthcoming paper, we propose a new procedure that exactly controls the FDR in finite samples. Okay, actually, um, this framework can be applied to other applications. Um, if you are a, a bit familiar with causal inference, it can be used to detect positive individual treatment effects. So individual treatment effects are random variables that describe the difference in outcomes under treatment and without treatment. So these two outcomes are two random variables, O1 and O0. And by detecting positive individual treatment effects, we are interested in whether one outcome is larger than the other. And you can fit this example into our uh, framework by taking the threshold C to be one of the outcome and the, the outcome Y to be the other uh, potential outcome. And it is also applies to detecting outliers and concept trips. So for example, given a set of normal transactions and a set of new transactions, it can be used to decide whether the new transactions are from a known distribution that is up to a covariate shift from P. I think that's basically all that I would like to talk. Maybe it's a good time to um, come to a summary. So just to summarize, um, we argue that in prediction-assisted screening problems, the FDR can be a sensible measure considering the follow-up studies we need to do on the selected units. And we propose a method that turns any prediction model into a reliable selection procedure. It is useful if you are interested in large outcomes. And the, the approach we, use, uh, we take is to build confidence scores, which are p-values uh, uh, upon any prediction model. And it outputs the smaller set that are mostly true discoveries so that your follow-up investigations are well-deserved. And we also have some extension to situations with covariate shifts, which are still like ongoing work and it requires some more complicated methodology and theory. So our paper for the covariate shift is still not out yet, but uh, the IID case uh, is on archive and feel free to check it out if you are interested. I think that's all I have today. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>